process that I'm just going to touch on briefly. Gas tungsten arc welding, GTAW or TIG, often called TIG welding, TIG. You might have heard it from the name Healy arc. Now with this particular process, instead of having a uh, metallic or a steel electrode, the electrode is made of tungsten, just like the filament in our incandescent bulbs. And tungsten has a very high melting point, and as a result, the arc does not melt the tungsten. It certainly doesn't consume the tungsten and put it into uh, the weld pool. Rather, it becomes an electrical conductor. We still have the six to 8,000 degree arc. The arc is sufficient to melt the base material and melt any filler that we add. The shielding gas today is typically argon or argon helium blends, but when it was first used, helium was used. And that's why heliarc came to be known as uh, one of the terms that was applied to the process. Today we call it gas tungsten arc welding or TIG welding. It's very slow, although it's very, very precise, and we get very high quality welds from it. Again, we have a source of gas shielding. We have a power supply, a small handheld torch, the uh, tungsten electrode, and the work that we're going to weld on. It's often used for the more exotic materials, whether it's welding on stainless steels or uh, uh, other uh, higher alloy, more complicated uh, steel systems. Uh, for the convention center in Pittsburgh, uh, there was a stainless, or there is a stainless steel roof, and that stainless steel roof was welded in place with gas tungsten arc welding. Incidentally, this also shows one of the latest uh, develops in, developments in power supplies. These are now inverter-based machines. Uh, the old rule of thumb was you needed 100 pounds of steel for every 100 amps you got out of a welding machine. So a 500 amp welding machine weighed 500 pounds. The inverters have condensed that down, made it very simple, and now we get uh, maybe 10 amps out of every pound of material that we put into the uh, welding machine, and that makes it very uh, portable and also electrically efficient. Gas tungsten arc is often used for aluminum. I know it's a steel conference, a steel program, uh, but uh, gas tungsten are commonly used for aluminum. And this is an old picture um, because we, uh, Bobby Labonte doesn't drive the interstate car anymore, uh, but uh, my son still works at interstate, so I get a threefer out of this. I get to talk about gas tungsten arc welding and uh, there's a Lincoln welder and an interstate battery. So buy red welders, green batteries, and uh, weld whenever you can. Uh, all right. If I didn't have these slides in here, one of you would be asking this question. We didn't have this in the first three and happened every time, so we added it in. What about low hydrogen? What's low hydrogen? Why is hydrogen good or bad, or how does that all fit together? In welding, hydrogen's bad. Hydrogen causes cracking under certain conditions. It doesn't cause cracking under all conditions. So let's talk about what hydrogen does. In this picture on the left, you see a, a weld. On the right is the base metal. In between the two is the heat-affected zone. That's the portion of the base metal that gets hot but doesn't melt. And through the heat-affected zone of this piece of material, you see a crack. And that's a hydrogen crack. And cracks are bad. The worst thing that happens in welding is when we get a crack. We try to join two things together and it cracks instead. Very undesirable. What drives hydrogen cracking? There are three factors that contribute to hydrogen cracking. I must have a sufficient level of hydrogen in the deposited weld metal. I must have a sufficient applied or residual stress and I must have a sufficiently uh, sensitive material. What can I do to reduce the hydrogen content? Hydrogen comes primarily from two sources, moisture and oil or oil-based materials. Unfortunately, moisture is everywhere, right? A lot of moisture in the air yesterday, wasn't there? So we have humidity. That can be a, cause, a source of hydrogen. If we don't care for our welding consumables, some of them absorb hydrogen out of the air. Some of them are, some electrodes are actually formulated with moisture in the coating. You say, well, why would you dare do that? Because sometimes that does some very nice things for other applications. We'll come back to that in a moment. 
If you buy low hydrogen electrodes, they come in hermetically sealed containers. You need to hold those, uh, put those uh, electrodes in a holding oven, heat the oven to a prescribed temperature. There's limits for how long those electrodes can be out. So, well, that's shielded metal arc. What about wire? Generally, wire is considered a low hydrogen process, but you leave it around, let it get rusty, you're going to have more hydrogen in your weld metal. Submerged arc, you saw that flux. What do you think happens when that flux is poured down on steel that has condensation on it? You suck it back up and reuse it. Now you're introducing moisture into the weld. Oil, grease are all sources of hydrogen. So we can limit the amount of hydrogen by purchasing, using the right kinds of electrodes to start with, and controlling the exposure of the electrode uh, to the atmosphere, and also welding on clean, dry steel. What about stress? I said you need enough applied or residual stress. And for, unfortunately, in welding, we always have residual stresses. So we can't get away from residual stresses in welding. And the residual stresses are assumed to be at the yield point of the material. We're going to review that a little bit later on. So I always have this, but I can reduce the residual stress when I use electrodes that are not stronger than necessary. And we're going to talk about undermatched weld metal later on. That's one of the ways I can reduce the residual stress. It is not wise to specify, or certainly, certainly not wise to specify, and it's not wise to use stronger than necessary materials in welding construction because it makes the blue circle get bigger. It makes it more sensitive to hydrogen cracking. What about sensitivity of material? Well, once again, if we weld on low carbon steel, low alloy steel, we have low sensitivity as the steel strength goes up, as the alloy goes up, the carbon goes up, we have a greater and greater sensitivity to hydrogen cracking. Now, in most cases, we control all three. And our codes and specifications are well developed, and they control these very, very nicely. I told you I wanted to come back to electrodes that have deliberate additions of moisture in them. That's this, uh, this visual. If the strength of the steel is sufficiently low, I have low stress. If my material is sufficiently insufficient, uh, insensitive to hydrogen cracking, the red circle's small, then I can have a lot of hydrogen in the system and I won't have hydrogen cracking. And that's why some electrodes are designed that are not low hydrogen. But you take those same electrodes and weld on high strength steel, uh, high alloy steel, high carbon steel, and you can get into hydrogen cracking. So now there's an array of electrodes out there, some that are not uh, low hydrogen, some are not low hydrogen. And we want to make sure that you're not nervous. We want you to be aware of it. And it's really pretty simple. AWS D1.1 has cared for this directly already. Because if you look at table 3.1, and I know you can't read all of that, so I will, oops, I will explain it a little bit. But we have different groupings of steels. This is group one. These are the lower strength steels, the lower alloy steels. And if you look at the allowable electrodes, these X's indicate that you can put any number in there that you want. That means that this doesn't need to be a low hydrogen electrode for these steels. If I go to group two, groups two steels are higher strength steels, and those are required to have low hydrogen electrodes. So the specification, the code has already covered what are the acceptable combinations of materials. I emphasize that because some uh, engineers leave the program feeling compelled that they need to put on drawing something about electrodes. I reviewed a lot of your notes over the years. Most of you don't get it right. <laughs> so what we encourage you to do is specify D1.1 and then expect compliance with D1.1, and that should take care of the low hydrogen concerns. Well, we went through welding processes, and what good is that to you? Once again, the code has put in restrictions on processes and applications and procedures, and there's not a compelling reason for you to have to add in additional requirements with respect to processes. In fact, we generally encourage you not to get into specification of processes. Leave that up to the contractor who has an understanding of the application, the equipment, the people, uh, the qualifications of the personnel, uh, and they are usually in the best position to select the process. Let me dissect what I said just so it's very clear. Welders need to be qualified by process. 
I may have all kinds of people in my shop that have all qualified with flux cord arc welding. And if the job says I need to use shielded metal arc welding, then I need to go out and get all those people requalified if they're not qualified with um, uh, shielded metal arc welding. And what's their experience base? Probably with flux core. So now they're using a new means and method. And they have to get up to speed with that. The welding equipment used for flux core may not be the same as the equipment used for shielded metal arc welding. So there may be a purchase of equipment. It's usually best to leave that decision up to the contractor. Now, where are you going to find the various processes? Submerged arc, if it's a big, long, usually straight weld, if it can be automated, that's where you'll find submerged arc. That's why our long plate girders, big transfer girders, often welded to submerged arc. Gas shielded flux cores become the workhorse, the major process that's used in the shop today. Self shielded flux cores, what you're going to find for field welding. Shielded metal arc welding, because of the relative inefficiency of the process, it's simple but it's relatively slow, making it expensive to use. You're going to find it for small applications, miscellaneous uh, uh, repairs, uh, for tack welding of things together. A gas metal arc may be the contractor's uh, choice to replace gas shielded flux core in the shop. I guess this is a good time for me to ask if there are any questions. Any questions on processes? Right. Hearing none, we'll move into uh, the next session, the section Introduction to Welded Connections. We're going to start out with joints. What are joints? Joints define the relative positioning of materials coming together. We have five joints. Butt joints, T-joints, corner joints, lap joints, edge joints. And you said, I've never seen an edge joint. I don't know what that is. An edge joint is usually associated with sheet metal applications, usually when we have a seal weld that we need to seal up some kind of container or ex uh, uh, enclosure. So all of our steel that we're going to join together will configure itself in one of these five different joints. Now a T-joint need not always be 90 degrees or limits for how far you can rotate a T and still call it a T. Eventually, if you rotate it far enough, a T becomes a lap. And the American Welding Society has definitions for all of these so that we know exactly what kind of joint we have. Notice that there are no welds in here yet. Oftentimes, that joint shown in the upper left-hand corner, uh, people will say that that's a butt weld. It's not a butt weld. It's a butt joint. It's not even welded yet. On the right-hand side at the top, you see another joint. People might call that a fillet joint or fillet weld. It's not welded yet. It's a T-joint. The joints simply describe the relative positioning of the materials that are involved. Now, to those joints, we pro uh, apply a variety of weld types. And we have four or five major weld types, depending on how you divide them out. The first major weld type is a groove weld. And under that heading of groove welds, we have two uh, subcategories, a complete joint penetration groove weld, or CJP. Now, some of you call those CP welds for complete penetration. That's not too bad. That's been obsolete for about 20 years. Some of you call it FPs for full penetration. That's been obsolete for about 40 years. Uh, so uh, we might want to get our terminology up to, up to speed today. CJP, complete joint penetration groove weld. And then the other type of groove weld, PJP, partial joint penetration groove weld. Again, you might be using PP uh, for uh, uh, partial penetration groove welds. Then we have fillet welds. And finally, plug welds and slot welds. And I'll put them in the same category. But if you want to break them out, that gives you five different weld types. Pictures of these now. There's a complete joint penetration groove weld in a butt joint, a partial joint penetration groove weld in a butt joint, Fillet welds in a T-joint, plug weld in a lap joint, and a slot weld in a lap joint. So all of our welds are going to fit into one of these four or five categories. All of our joints will fit into the five examples that I showed you before. Let's bore down into this a little further. We're going to look at groove welds. Groove welds are applied to butt, corner, and T-joints. If it's a CJP, we get full strength out of that. 
we get the full capacity for static loaded applications, statically loaded applications, we get the full capacity of the base material out of our welded connection with CJPs. Now for those of you who are bridge people, you know that a CJP groove weld doesn't give us the same category of performance uh, as we have for our base metal in cyclic loading or in fatigue. Our base metal is category uh, A material. If we grind off the reinforcement and inspect it, we get a category B out of our groove welds. If we leave the reinforcement in place, we get category C. So when I emphasize for static strength, I'm talking about uh, static loading situations, not the dynamic loading associated with uh, fatigue sensitive applications. Groove welds can be loaded uh, in tension or compression or in shear. So we have a variety of loads that can be applied to those. Here are pictures of some various groove welds in different types of joints. Partial penetration groove welds uh, in a butt joint, double sided. A complete joint penetration groove weld in a corner joint on the left. Uh, in a T joint on the right with steel backing uh, left in place shown with the green. Under CJP groove welds, or under all groove welds, but we'll look at CJP in particular, we have terminology uh, that we should understand. The total angle between the uh, two components that make up the joint, the total angle is called the included angle. If we have equal bevels on either side, 15 on one, 15 on the other, our included angle is 30 degrees. There's a gap between the two plates. There may be a gap that's called the root opening R, uh, is the typical letter used to abbreviate that. And we may have backing. Backing could be made of steel uh, or non-metallic materials, and we will be talking about backing later on. To that uh, groove, we apply uh, the weld metal. The blue represents the weld metal. Uh, obviously, it has to melt and become liquid, and then it solidifies. The dark, darker gray area represents the heat affected zone. Now that's the portion of the base metal that got hot but didn't melt. Again, steel's melting in and around 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. We have liquid metal at 2800 Fahrenheit. On the other side of that interface, we have solid metal at 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. And just like water coexists with ice in a glass, uh, right at that interface, we have material basically at the same temperature, but one's transformed for, to a liquid, one has not. Now, the heat affected zone is important, particularly when we get to higher strength steels. It's very important if you weld on aluminum. It's not so important for our lower strength steels. It's not so important for most of our uh, construction grade steels that we use. Why could it be important? Because the properties of this heat affected zone depend on the initial chemistry of the steel. And then it depends on the cooling rate that's experienced by that heat affected zone when the welds are made. And depending on the composition of the material and depending on the cooling rate, the heat affected zone may have properties that are different from either the weld or the original base material. And once again, the construction steels that we use, the steels that are pre-qualified and listed in D1.1, have been investigated to make sure that we don't have large, major heat effect zone properties. Unfortunately, sometimes you put components in your buildings uh, that may not go through the rigorous, rigorous analysis of the steel. You might get an AIS, excuse me, an SAE grade steel like a 1045. Now that's not a pre-qualified steel in D1.1. You don't find it listed in AISC, but it has 45 points of carbon. If I have 45 points of carbon in the heat effect zone and I cool that rapidly, that heat effect zone is going to be very high in strength. It could be very brittle. There are ways for us to deal with that, usually through increased preheat to slow down the cooling rate. But for our purposes today, heat affected zones are not a major problem for our steels with minimum specified yield strengths of probably 70 KSI or less, and that's 90% or 95% of what you deal with. A992, five, uh, 572, A36, 
shouldn't be a, a, a concern. On those rare projects, when you get into things like A514, A517, quenched and tempered using U.S. Steel's trade name T1 Steel, uh, now the heat affected zone becomes a concern. Now I need to be more careful with that. Some of you bridge people. Dr. Kulak, we have a bunch of bridge people today. So we want to pay attention, uh, we want to, pay attention to bridges today. Um, in any event, uh, when we get to higher strength steels, we need to be more sensitive to the heat affected zone concerns. At the top of the weld, we have what we call reinforcement. I think that's an undesirable term. Uh, reinforcement tends to imply something good. In welding, it's not. Uh, in fatigue, it reduces our uh, allowable stress range by leaving that reinforcement in place. Uh, nevertheless, that's the term that we call that extra metal on the surface. We don't get any credit for that in design. The graphic demonstrates what we get credit for, which is the weld throat. A CJP groove weld has a defined throat that's equal to the thickness of the thinner material join. Two materials of the same thickness. The throat dimension in a CJP is the same as the thickness of the steel. If we don't have the same thickness, then the throat's defined as the thickness of the thinner material involved. So the throat is the same as the thickness of the base material. That's one of the advantages of CJP groove weld. Designing the CJP is so simple. You don't need to do anything. You just put in the tail of the weld symbol arrow, CJP, and you're all done. No determining the number of bolts or the spacing of the bolts or the diameter of the bolts. You just say CJP and you're all done. Now, unfortunately, that also leads to an abuse. And that is where people specify CJPs and they don't need CJPs for the application. But no design calculations are required for static strength. If you're involved with bridges, we need to go check our stress range and make sure that the welded details are within the stress range allowable. We get the same strength out of our CJP groove welds regardless of the joint details that we use. So there are bevel groove welds and J groove welds, and I think we're going to examine those. But regardless of the details, we get the same strength. So we usually leave it up to the uh, fabricator to select those groove weld details. And in a term that I'm going to explain later, for CJP groove welds in tension, we need to use matching strength weld metal. Now let's take a look at these groove welds uh, types that I previewed to you. For thinner materials, we can bring in two materials, bottom to each other, and we call that a square edge groove weld. And if we're less than about an eighth of an inch in material thickness, we can weld from one side and we can melt through the cross section and get a full uh, strength or a CJP groove weld. If we weld from both sides, we probably get up to about a quarter inch and do that. But after we get to heavier material, we can't penetrate all the way through the thickness and we start to need to apply a bevel. If we bevel one member, that becomes a bevel groove weld. Apply a bevel to both, that's a V-groove weld. If we machine or otherwise prepare a J uh, preparation on one side, that becomes a J-groove weld. Do that on both, we get a U-groove weld. When we have a formed surface, like a cold formed uh, sheet, or um, the corners of our uh, A500 tubing, for example, uh, and we weld in that cavity, that is a flare bevel groove weld. Uh, that's the same as when we have a round to a flat, so also a flare bevel. You take two rounded surfaces, put them together, that becomes a flare V groove weld. And then if I have two rounds, that's also a flare V groove weld. Now our welds may be single sided or double sided. Obviously this is a single bevel groove weld. And if I bevel from both sides and then weld from both sides, I have a double bevel groove weld. The same thing could happen with Vs, a single V shown here and a double V shown here. Generally speaking, there are economics, uh, economic advantages to double-sided joints. Generally uh, speaking, we have distortion advantages to double-sided joints. But we can't always get to double sides and uh, uh, usually, again, that's uh, an issue best left up to the contractor to determine. Now, we can't put each groove weld type into every joint type. For example, here's a bevel groove in a butt, and you notice that looks very much like a bevel groove in a corner. 
And that looks very much like a bevel groove in a, groove in a T. And if that doesn't look like a T, maybe that looks like a T. But notice that I can't put a V groove in a T. I can do it. It's not what I want. Uh, so we need to match our weld types with our joint types uh, because you can't put every joint uh, together. Next topic I want to talk about is backing, backing that goes underneath the joint. Now the green uh, illustration uh, shown here is to signify backing. And when I put liquid metal in the joint, if the gap between the joint or the root opening is too great, the liquid metal is going to drip through. When I'm dealing with building construction, uh, I have all kinds of tolerances that particularly at the job site come together and I need to accommodate. And so I've cut the beam to length. I've got my columns in place. I want to keep the columns plumb. And I'm going to need to fit the beam and kind of split the difference and maintain some kind of an alignment of my structure during erection. So how do I know that that gap is not going to get too big? Over the years, we've typically accommodated that by using steel backing. And so we can now have some variation in the fit of the joint and still get a quality weld put in place. This is backing in a corner joint that may be in a large box section uh, that you might be involved with. And this is our beam to column connection uh, that's typical of many of our applications uh, of welding in the field. Now, for just a moment, I want you to envision this as the bottom flange of a beam being joined to a column. In fact, that's a common application. And that actually was the application that uh, caused uh, a lot of concerns coming out of the Northridge earthquake. So we're going to be talking about that for just a little bit. Uh, that backing, the green material I showed you, could be made of steel. That's the most commonly used uh, material. It could be copper, it could be ceramic, it could be some other materials, but we're going to talk about all three of these today. Now, steel backing, three things I want you to know about steel backing. If you don't remove it, it's permanent. It's part of the structure. So it becomes part of the overall weldment, and it introduces some notch effects that may be detrimental to the performance of the structure. Once again, let's assume now this is the bottom beam flange being joined to a column flange. Properly made, the backing is put into place, and then the root pass is applied. Now, the root pass should have fusion to the column, fusion to the beam, and if it's properly made, it has fusion to the backing. And then we complete the weld in the number of passes that are necessary in order to do that. Let's take away all those welds, all those fusion zones, and just look at the steel as if we took a saw cut through there. And let's remember this principle. There are no secondary members in welded construction. And when I bolt things together, it's impossible for a crack in one member to go through the bolt and jump into the other member. But when I weld materials together, a crack in one member can transfer through the weld into another member. And so we need to remember this principle that in welded construction, there are no secondary members. Whatever you weld on there could become part of the load path. The naturally occurring lack of fusion plane between the backing and the column is going to be there no matter how good a weld we make. Now let's remember this January 17, 1994 morning when in California the earth decides to move. The inertia of the, the building holds it behind for a while until it springs uh, in a spring-like uh, response uh, starts to oscillate. And the beam to column connections are subject to a bending moment, right? And depending on the motion of the beam, we could be seeing tension applied to that root region. Does everyone see how tension could be applied there during a seismic event? And so even if we have a good quality weld, we have a notch effect that could become the point for fracture initiation. And in fact, cracks initiated from that point and went in a wide variety of directions uh, based upon other factors but uh, routinely uh, in those connections that fractured, the initiation point was in the root, uh, right where that steel backing was left in place. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that Northridge was a one-dimensional problem and this was the only factor. 
it were that simple, we would have solved it a long time ago. There are many, many factors, and this is not suggesting this is the only factor, but it was a major factor. And it's also a factor that has resulted in a change in practice. And the change in practice is in high seismic zones, and even some reduced seismic zones, typically steel backing is required to be removed. Now the process used is called air arc gouging. It could be ground off, but the contractor goes in there, removes the steel backing, and then applies a reinforcing fillet weld. And that gives that connection of the bottom beam to column flange um, a connection much greater fracture resistance. And that's why in the pre-qualified connection details coming from the CPRP document, uh, you see emphasis on removal of steel backing. I know we're in the Midwest. I know we have reduced seismic concerns, but you do work that goes all across the country. And in New England states, this is a routine practice uh, for uh, some of the lower seismic uh, concerns that they are dealing with. Removing steel backing is not simple. It's a very complicated, costly process. So if it has to be removed, some contractors have said, well, why don't we use something that doesn't need to be gouged off? And one of the materials that can be used is a copper backing. Now, you might remember the copper has a lower melting point than steel, and so you say, how does that work? Well, it also has a higher rate of thermal conductivity. And so when that hot metal hits the copper, the copper sucks the heat away so fast, you don't get the localized con uh, concentration of energy that causes the copper to melt. Copper is removable afterwards. Importantly, it's also electrically conductive, but there are some metallurgical effects that you should be aware of. Now, I've replaced the steel backing with something that's kind of brown in color to represent copper. Properly made, the root pass has fusion to the beam flange, to the column flange, but does not fuse to the copper. It simply uh, condenses or solidifies on the copper, but doesn't fuse. Then the rest of the weld's made, and when you're all done, the copper can be removed. How's the copper held in place initially? Usually mechanically. You clamp it in place uh, to start with. The problem is this. If you melt into the copper, the copper goes into the weld. If the copper goes into the weld, it can segregate during the solidification and cooling of that root pass and can lead to a crack. A crack's the worst thing that happens in welding. Fortunately, this is somewhat self-limiting because when they're all done, this copper doesn't just immediately peel off. The copper, which is very expensive, can't be reused. So the contractor has good incentive to keep people from doing this. But this is the concern with using copper. Some people have worked with ceramic backing. Ceramic is also removable. It's non-electrically conductive. The white material now represents ceramic backing. It's usually held in place with an adhesive tape that goes to the ceramic. Now, importantly, ceramic backing is not electrically conductive. So while when I get ready to start my arc, I need to have a completed electrical circuit. I can arc against the column flange. I can arc against the beam flange. And once I get a weld pool established between the two, I can arc on the weld pool. But until I bridge the gap between the two, the arc is going to go out when I oscillate across that non-conductive ceramic material. If I try to strike the arc on the ceramic, that wire might just push the ceramic out of the joint and doesn't work at all. So special technique is required in order to do that. You do get the arc started on one of the two materials. You get the puddle started, you bridge it together, and once you have that, you stay on the edge of the puddle and the welder can make the weld. Now, how are codes and standards going to handle these issues? 